Bloomberg Business Week published the crazy story of fashion photographer Baruch Vega, who lived secret lives and managed to scam Colombian drug lords and the U.S. government. Baruch Vega ran a scheme that ensnared Colombian cocaine kingpins and gave him a life of luxury. Then one put a price on his head. This is the story of a fashion photographer who conned drug lords and the DEA. All of the accounts were covered by Bloomberg, and the details are as follows. Kindly like and subscribe to our channel. The Raid Fashion photographer Baruch Vega was drinking Merlot with a bunch of models, stylists, and assistants when the FBI arrived at his Miami Beach penthouse door. The band had just returned from shooting in Puerto Rico and Cancun for two days. They were getting ready for another one the next day in Jamaica. It was March 21, 2000. Vega was 53 years old and at the prime of his career. He was a fixture at South Beach's popular restaurants, always wearing a tight black t-shirt and surrounded by beautiful women. He owned a nine-seat hawker jet. He was considering marrying one of them as his fourth wife. But this glamorous existence was only a ruse. Vega was a freelance spy for the U.S. government, despite the fact that neither his four daughters nor his fashion friends knew. He'd worked his way into the social circles of Colombia's drug lords. Vega was also running a scam while providing intelligence to the U.S. He'd persuaded some of the world's most dangerous drug traffickers, including a former shooter for Pablo Escobar, to pay him more than $100 million in between photo shoots. The narcos were convinced by Vega that he was close with corrupt officials of the all-powerful United States government's Blitz Committee, an interagency task force, and that he could solve their legal problems for a fee. Vega was, as far as the cartel members could ascertain, a real person. The norms of the drug war didn't appear to apply after they paid him. Men on the run from the law were allowed to pass through customs. Criminals and Drug Enforcement Administration agents frequented strip clubs. To commemorate the millennium, a well-known trafficker organized a party on a yacht near Miami, another vacation at Disney World. Drug traffickers were such frequent visitors to Vega's apartment that when one, known as El Medico, the doctor, rang his doorbell that evening, he didn't seem startled. El Medico wanted to talk about the $7 million he had given to Vega. He claimed the FBI was aware of the situation and had been investigating who had been paid off. Vega tried to avoid the inquiries by claiming that he'd simply spent the money and El Medico appeared content. The FBI was listening in on Vega's conversation. Agents arrived around 9.30 p.m., just as his group was about to leave for dinner. Vega remained composed, offered the FBI officers wine, and instructed his companions to order a veal chop for him. The agents refused the wine. They told Vega to sit down and put on latex gloves before examining his flat. Vega tried to guide them to a camera case with more than $400,000 in cash. He claimed the money was part of his DEA employment. The agents, on the other hand, were not convinced. They interrogated him for several hours. They informed him that he was being detained the next morning. Money laundering and obstruction of justice were among the charges leveled against him. He allegedly stole money from dealers and obstructed investigations, according to the FBI. Officers raided the DEA's Miami headquarters the following week, seizing laptops and notebooks belonging to anyone connected to Vega. It looked like one of the biggest scandals in the history of the drug war. And then the case was dropped, no explanation given. Vega is keen to explain why and convey his experience 20 years later. He recalls touching paths with all of the main players, like a narco Forrest Gump. He claims to have provided cocaine money to Panamanian dictator Manuel Noriega and to have had a sexual relationship with Escobar's wife. He employed models to recruit cartel members as informants and trained DEA agents to appear as his photography assistants. Then there was the moment Medellin capo Jose Gonzalo Rodriguez Gacha threatened him by displaying two severed hands in a pail of blood. Vega was, according to Vega, one of the most successful undercover operatives of all time, a spy whose charm, cunning, and cool under pressure were matched only by his skill with the ladies. He admits to swindling traffickers, but insists he did so on behalf of the DEA. As bizarre as these assertions may appear, the majority are backed up by internal DEA documents and thousands of pages of court records from subsequent trafficking convictions. In interviews, two dozen federal agents, prosecutors and defense lawyers, as well as one enraged former cartel boss, claim that Vega pulled off a feat that should not have been possible. He conned two of the world's most dangerous cartels, Colombia's fearsome Norte del Valle cartel and the United States government. It became such a mess that the government as a whole just said, fucking bury this, says Paul Crane. The latter was a DEA agent in Bogota in the late 90s. If we try to unravel this, we're going to have to prosecute FBI agents, DEA agents, prosecutors. It was so crazy, where do you even start? A lucrative career. A Bloomberg reporter narrates his meeting with Vega, and these were, in his words, the account of the meeting. I found Vega through an online portfolio link stamped with his personal logo, an intertwined B and V. 
and featuring page after page of pouty-lipped women in skimpy swimsuits. I wrote to ask if he might be interested in discussing his undercover years. He was. We talked for hours on the phone, then at a bar at the Four Seasons Hotel in New York. We were able to dismantle the biggest drug trafficking operation in history, he said, and took a sip of wine. Now 72, Vega stands about 5 foot 10 with buzzed gray hair and a deeply lined face. He joked that he has the appearance of a Sharpe, yet he is still attractive. He was hitting on the waitress within minutes of my arrival. Models are spectacularly attractive, while millionaires are mega multi-billionaires, according to him. He informed me he was in Manhattan to raise funds for a cryptocurrency venture. Born in Bogota, Vega claimed he was recruited by the CIA to infiltrate radical student groups. The CIA does not reveal its informants, but two federal officers verified that Vega worked for the agency at some point. Around the same period, he became interested in photography, initially as a means of meeting women. He'd approach them on the street and ask if he may photograph them. He'd tell them how wonderful they'd look naked once he'd finished photographing. Passion, according to Vega, would take over. They were on the verge of exploding, he said. It was a fantastic retreat for them. Vega said he quit the CIA in the mid-70s and moved to New York, where he started a modeling agency, Intramodel Beauty. Rafael Rodriguez, better known by his alias Amilcar, a crack-smoking Venezuelan hit guy, became his buddy. Vega partied at Studio 54, sat in Miami's Mutiny Hotel Champagne-filled hot springs, and assisted Amilcar's cartel associates with money laundering. There were drugs throughout the place. You'd think this was a low-class event if they didn't offer you cocaine, Vega stated. He went on to say that he never partakes. He also had reservations about Rodriguez. When the hitman admitted to killing several of their mutual acquaintances as part of a turf battle among Miami's cocaine cowboys, Vega reported him to the authorities. Rodriguez died in prison after pleading guilty to homicide. In 1985, Vega's new law enforcement friends came in helpful. He was in financial trouble, having been duped out of the majority of the money he'd made selling the modeling business by a showy tax shelter marketer with two mischievous pet monkeys. I wouldn't have believed it if it hadn't been for the fact that the dispute, along with the monkeys, is documented in court papers and newspaper articles from the time. Vega's law enforcement contacts suggested that he worked for them as a paid informant. That sounds like a lot of fun. Vega's way of life wasn't inexpensive. Models require private jets, houses, and huge hotels, he remarked. That's what separates a model from a typical woman. In October 1999, Vega heard from his DEA handlers that something big was going down. He says they told him to tell the traffickers he was trying to flip to lie low for a few days. He called Pisa's widow and told her to spread the word. The tip was accurate. Before dawn on October 13, 1999, Hundreds of DEA agents and Colombian police officers raided the homes of traffickers across the country. In Medellin, surveillance planes made sure the coast was clear before truckloads of agents cruised into a kingpin's ranch to grab him. Other officers in Bogota smashed through a plate glass window at a trafficker's mansion, interrupting an all-night birthday party. All told, 32 were arrested. Operation Millennium, as it was known, was one of the biggest busts since the Escobar takedown. A story has three sides. The DEA's final report on the incident, which was published by Narco News Online, revealed that Vega's organization broke DEA laws in every way possible. However, despite their protestations, testimony suggested that Vega's managers were aware of the operation. In the 1980s, Vega claimed that an FBI agent assisted him in developing the system. Investigators tracked down Robert Levinson, Vega's former FBI handler, who verified the story. Levinson claimed that he let Vega keep any money he charged traffickers. According to Vega's FBI source file, one provided Vega $50,000 and a Jaguar sports car as a retainer, while Escobar's cartel reimbursed Vega $15,000. The United States was in an impossible situation, according to one person involved in the case who spoke on the condition of anonymity. If Vega is charged with the scam, he will be able to bring all of the people who were part of it to testify. Even if the prosecution could prove that Tinsley had not authorized Vega to solicit payments, convicting an informant who claimed he was only performing his job would be difficult. The DEA and FBI would also suffer public embarrassment as a result of the trial. Tinsley, who had been suspended throughout the internal affairs probe, and Castillo, the young agent who accompanied Vega to the conferences, were both reinstated in 2004. Four years later, Tinsley retired from the DEA and now runs a private security firm that calls itself the first and only Judeo-Christian intelligence agency. The assertion by Vega that he could offer get-out-of-jail cards was false. However, it turned out to be somewhat correct, because Vega duped his clients into snitching. His clients, at least the ones who weren't murdered, are now free. None of them were sentenced to more than six years in prison. Some have returned to Colombia, while others have relocated to the state of Florida. The drug lord who refused to pay and turned on Vega, Ochoa, was sentenced to life in prison. He isn't expected to be released until 2026. Conclusion 
Vega now lives in a modest house near the ocean on Maui. A retired DEA agent from Bogota, Crane, estimates that the photographer's con netted $50 million. On the other hand, Vega claims the amount was significantly lower and that he spent it all on wine, jets, and other model-related things. He claims he didn't store any in offshore accounts despite 20 years of experience as an underground money launderer. Without sounding arrogant, I believe I am one of the best money launderers ever to work for the government, Vega claims. However, I possess a quality known as integrity. According to the reporter, Vega tells me this is true, all of it. A few times during our talks, though, he hints that I shouldn't necessarily take him at his word. A story has three sides, your side, my side, and the truth, Vega says, and no one is lying.